and also um, our speaker this morning is Dr. Weiji Wang, who is from southeastern China originally. Uh, Dr. Wang is an assistant professor at the UF Department of Food and Resource Economics and an affiliate faculty member of both the UF Water Institute and the Global Food Systems Institute. Dr. Wang's academic focus is on the research and public education in an approach to natural resources that is distinct from what we might normally think of as economics. Her research is in the area of non-market valuation, that is, valuing resources such as water that are not normally given a dollar value through the give and take of the marketplace. Other such non-market resources would be wildlife, wetlands, and air quality, for example. Her list of publications and presentations is very impressive. She has studied and written extensively on the economic impacts of resource pollution, particularly of water bodies such as lakes, and also of ambient air pollution. Professor Wang took her PhD in economics from Virginia Tech with a prize-winning dissertation. She held a faculty fellowship at State University of New York, Geneseo, for two years and joined the UF Food and Resource Economics in Department in August 2022. I'm sorry she wasn't there in the early 90s when I was studying water resource economics. She earned a BS in economics with honors and a BA in English from the Jiangxi University of Finance and Economics. Please welcome Dr. Wing. Well, thank you, Felix. Thank you so much for the great presentation. As Phyllis was in, in her introduction, I'm an economist. So people always ask me, what do you do as an economist? I say, I study water issues. And then people start to puzzling and ask, I don't think that's a job of economist because I think economists, you should study GDP, economic growth, or you should tell me how to invest in stock market. By the way, tell me which stock I should buy today. So in this presentation, I'm going to tell you my story as a non-traditional economist who is very interested in studying water issues. And also, this is just my first year in Florida. So I'm still in the process of learning the water resources and the water issues we have in Florida. So you, the presentation content you will see is majority from my dissertation, which is focused on Wisconsin, but I will see why this is important for Florida and how we can transfer that knowledge for the protection of Florida water resources. Oh, yeah, great. Thank you so much. So my interest of water issues actually comes from my childhood experiences. I was grow up in Jiangxi province in China. Does anyone heard about this place? Oh, very nice. Thank you so much. Because if you even for some people from China, I told them I'm from Jiangxi, people will think a while and see, huh? It does not sound very familiar to me because our province is a less developed province. Like although we are kind of in the east part of China, but we are the least developed province in China. But I'm proud of my hometown because we have a large water resources. I grew up along the Poyang Lake, which is the biggest freshwater lake in China. I enjoyed amenities there, especially I enjoy bird, bird, bird watching because this lake is famous and it's a habitat for a lot of migratory birds. But when I grow up, I noticed a big issue of my hometown and our water resources. I'm seeing the decline of both water quantity and water quality. At that time, I started to wrestling about two ideas. On the first hand, I want to protect my 
the water resources because I think that's important. But at that, at the other hand, I was thinking about the people in my hometown. They need to improve their living standards. We need to have economic growth. Otherwise, you would see a lot of people like me, especially for females in my province. They don't have good education opportunities. It's hard for them to pursue what they want. So this is kind of a tricky question. How can we balance the, the protection of natural resources and also thinking about the economic growth? And then at that time, I found out there's a discipline called economics. And within this, this, this discipline, there's a subfield called environmental and natural resource economics. And what we do as environmental and natural resource economists is it's like we are taking those trade-offs in mind, economic, economic growth and protection of natural resources. And we are thinking about what we can do to balance these trade-offs and improve the social welfare of the entire society. So that's what we do as an environmental and a natural resource economist. I'm going to fill in in some economic concepts at the start of my presentation. And I'll tell you why this is important and how can we think like economists. So I was a teacher at a liberal college and a question my students ask me, they are saying, Professor, you tell me, I, I understand water is important, but if you look at the price of water, water is cheap. But someone told me diamond is not that important in terms of a lot of issues, but diamond is expensive. Why? You tell me as an economist. So I, I put up this, this figure here. I call it the paradox of value. If you look at the price of diamond, oh, the time, say, my name is Miss Diamond. I cost $1 million for a small bit of money. And then for water, it's just very cheap for a bottle of water. Why? What could be the reason? I w then I tell my students, let's think about this. Let's think about some scenarios. It's like now you are not in Gainesville. Now you are not buying water easily from supermarket. But let's think about a scenario. You are in a desert. You, you want water because you don't have water for three days. It's a life event. It's a life-threatening event. And now tell me if, say, there's a helicopter drop of water, a bottle of water, which is essential to your life. How much are you willing to pay for that bottle of water? I'm going to do a quick survey here. Do you think it's still is one dollar? No, right, because this is important to us. So what do you think? How much do you want to pay? Or are you willing to pay in this scenario? Yeah, the cost of production, say, if we want to helicopter drop off a lot of waters, what's the cost? It must be high. It's definitely higher than one. Any other thoughts? Yeah, to save your life. Yeah, a thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars, or even more, depending on your income and uh, depending on the, capa the financial capacity you have. So if you, we compare these two examples, what was the underlying reason? What's the rule here? And this is the word we are always saying as an economist is scarcity. Because there's a scarcity, there's limited resources. Then as an economist, we need to think about how to optimize the management of these resources. We won't have a water issue if we have a lot 
of good water. We also, too much water is not good, as we see in Florida. That's another story about flooding. But as an economist, we usually keep scarcity in our mind, and then we are thinking about the prices. And when economics, when economists are thinking about the prices, actually we are thinking about marginal benefit rather than total benefit. So let me make an example. When we see diamond, maybe the price we, we have in our mind usually is a piece of diamond. Or we we'll see one unit of diamond. This is what say, uh, we call margin. So for water, that's a different issue. Maybe in today's scenario, the marginal value of water, which means you can think about one bottle of water, which is low. But if you're thinking about the total resources, we have the total value. And if you're thinking about the unbalanced supply across the world, we are sometimes lucky as well in Florida. We have actually relative to the, our Western like uh, states like like California, our water is relatively more compared to them. So that's why when you look at the news, we talked about the Colorado River a lot, and there's a, a recent news about the Colorado River. It's because compared to Florida, water is more scarce. Scarce, then the scarcity plays an important role. So then, when we're thinking about the price. Actually, economists is thinking about under different scenarios, what's your willingness to pay? So the willingness to pay will change according to different scenarios and according to demand. So right now, if this is not a life-threatening event, my willingness to pay for water is kind of, is kind of low compared to the, the case I just mentioned, which is a, if you want water, and you don't have water for three days. That's a different scenario. And then if we think about marginal value or marginal utility, then I want to bring you another concept, which is called the law of diminishing marginal utility. So I have a baby. My baby loves donut. So, but even for my baby, if I bought a box, say a dozen of donut, to her and ask her, do you want a donut? At the first one, she will say, yeah, yeah, I love it. Let me get a piece of it. And for the second one, she may feel less excited, but then she will say, I will take it. But if you keep offering her, this is not I do, but if you do an experiment, if you keep offering my baby the donuts, she will stop at the first one. The, 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 maybe the fifth one, because she feels full. And the, as economists, we say the utility or the satisfactory you get from one more donut is low in the fifth one compared to the satisfactory you get from the first one. Or you may think about the, the, the case of pizza. For the first pizza, your satisfactory is extremely high. If, and this will be very high when you are hungry, very hungry. But after you get maybe three pieces of big pizza, you want to stop. You don't want to give to eat any pizza. And if someone say, I will give you for free, and you will say, no, I don't want it. But because when I was full, the the utility I get or the satisfactory I get from pizza is not positive anymore. It will bring you negative utility. And that's what we see as the law of diminishing marginal utility. The more pizza you have, the marginal utility you will get from one piece of it will decrease. And now, no more economic concept. Let's go back to the water part. Here is a figure I get from USGS, and then we talk, it talks about the different kinds of water use we have in, in the United States. When we think about water, I usually talk to people, it's like the water is a complex issue. 
it's complex because you need to think about where it comes from. You need to think about the inequality across different regions. And then you need to think about the different users of it. We, are you, we all rely on water in our everyday life. Some you may realize it, some you may not. As you will see here, in the US, our water use comes from the surface water and the groundwater. Actually, they have different issues. So from, for groundwater, it's more like a common pool resources. And we need to think about how to manage it. And then if you think about how we use it, we use it for domestic use, like we use it for shower, for drinking. And, but also, water is, you can, some water system is public supply. And then we use it for industry. A lot of industry relay, they need water. Even nowadays, for, we talk about AI a lot. But thinking about what you need to produce those chips, which is important for AI, you need water. This is important. Water is not only important for agriculture, it's also important for aquaculture. It's important for mining. It's important for summer, summer or, or energy gen generation. It's also in, important for irrigation. It's, all, it's important for everyone because we, want, we need to use water for different reasons. And then let's look at Florida. This is the data about water use in Florida. As you will see here, agriculture, they use water a lot in Florida, public supply as well. But there's other uses like, oh, by the way, we all need water for recreation. And that's the story I'm going to talk about later. And we need to use it for power generation. We need to use it for our industry need and what else. But the reason we want to study water issue as an economist, let's go back to the scarcity issues we talked about. Nowadays, a lot of factors are impacting the amount of good water or sustainable water use we could achieve. It actually will impact the scarcity of the water. Let's think about it. We, we, we as, a floor, as people live in Florida, we have the first-hand experience of extreme events. We all experienced hurricane year last year. The flooding will cause an issue to water quality. And also it will, it will impact the water supply of different water bodies. So climate change at those extreme events, they will impact our water supply. And if we think about the groundwater, 90% of Florida people, their drinking water source is from groundwater. But as I mentioned, groundwater is a common pool resource. You can get it. They can get it. And that, that it's hard to identify the property rights of the ghost groundwater. But, you, but your usage of groundwater will, affect, will in fact affect others' usage because it will make people getting harder and harder to get groundwater. So we need to thinking about those mismanagement of groundwater in mind. What else? We have the salt water intrusion problem, especially in my army. And we have a team of economists who are thinking about these issues and thinking about how we'll impact economic development of Florida. And then pollution is another issue. I think harmful algal bloom is familiar, maybe, or not to some of you, I, and I will talk about it later. But the reason is we want good water, but also we don't. We want good water, and so when we think about sustainable water use, we should not only think water quantity. We should thinking about the water pollution problem. And as Florida people love Florida, and the people are migrating in Florida. If you look at the people come to Tampa, Tampa is the destination which has the most people migrate in. The population growth will put the, wa the water system of Florida under pressure. And also we have the land degradation and we have others. So all those factors will impact the sustainable of water use. And the, 
I want to keep remind you, we, all the water systems, a lot of water issues, they are connected. Although I listed a lot of potential threats, but they have connections of all of them. So thinking about this figure, we need to, when we manage water issues, we need to think about the ecology side. Water is an important part for a lot of wildlife and species. And we need to think about the ecosystem services of water. And also, we need to think about how to treat our water, how to deal with the wastewater treatment. We need to think about how to sustain a good drinking water sources. We need to think about what if we have a drought. Maybe you, you think drought is not something for Florida, but at, at sometimes at different areas, it is. And also we have too much water flooding is another issue. And then thinking about the new development we are seeing across the state, how would the land use change affect the water management? This is another issue. All of all, my take home message is, it's complicated to study water issues. And we should all, always think about the connections of different water systems. It's not saying we need to manage one thing and we are all done. When we think about the water policies, my message is always like, we should think about what's the cost, what's the benefit, who bears the cost, who bears the benefit. Is there any something we can do and we can make the market work? So people always say, I don't want to play cards with economists because you, you economists has too much hand. You always told me there's one hand, there's another hand. And then I told them, no, as economists, we have invisible hands as well. Because if we can let the market work, that will be another issue. But how to design a water trading market, this is another question. I, I hope to talk about it later, but uh, that's another issue we are facing right now. So too much water, that let's, go back to some specific water bodies. So let's talk about freshwater lakes. So maybe let's think about where to go for weekends, where to go for recreation. I always choose freshwater lakes because I live because of my childhood experience. And also I think there's so much lakes can offer to us. We can do kayak in the lake. We can swim in. We can see the water birds. But this is what we see in Florida lakes. It's called the, uh, the algae bloom or algal blooms issue, which makes our lakes less good. And it's also, there's a lot of economic and health impact of the harm of the algal blooms. In my PhD dissertation, it actually is centered around just one question. My question is, how do people affect the lakes that they love? And how do those lakes inspire people to act? And in my dissertation, I want to think about the connections of humans and the lakes. And this is the conceptual framework I have. I'm going to walk you through all of this. Let's start with the land use and the management decisions because this is what we are seeing in Florida nowadays. People migrate in, they need home. They need home, they're, they're builders. And, uh, and you can see agricultural protection, the crop rotations, they're changing land use every day. Or not every day, uh, very frequently. So the land use and the, those agricultural management decisions along with the hydrological process what affects the water quality and the water quantity to the lakes. And don't forget, lakes offers a lot of ecosystem services. As humans, we enjoy the benefits of those ecosystem services. So those changes in water quality and the water quantity will affect the ecosystem services we received. And that's what we see, it will affect the value of ecosystem services. As an economist, people always ask me, why you are obsessed with putting a dollar 
on those ecosystem services? My answer is every policy has their benefit and the cost. If you want to compare the benefit and the cost in the same dimension, you need something people know, easy to understand, and it could be compared. And then, which is the monetary value we came up as economists. So for those ecosystem services, because of the change in ecosystem services, people around the lake or people that love the lakes, they will take actions. I've worked with multiple lake associations and the, such as the Lake Sunapee Protection Association, which is outside Boston, and uh, the Clean Lake Alliance outside Lake Mendota in Wisconsin, and the Oneida Lake uh, Protection Association, which is located in upstate New York, where I, I work with them when I was there. So those people, they will take actions. They, they will form some associations, or they were thinking about some ways to improve the water quality. And then those collective actions could potentially change the behaviors of those the local residents and also change the local policies. Those policies will affect the land use decision, say, by come up with some zoning laws or come up with some best management practice. And then it will affect the whole process. So my message is that if we think about the connections between humans and the lakes, we should think about it as a feedback loop. It's a dynamic process, which makes the water issue even hard. We need to think about how, how, are the system, how all the components are connected, but at, on the other side, those connections, they are not just there, they will change over time. So I work, my work uses a lot of data and, and the modeling. So in, in, in the, rest the part of my presentation. I'm just going to use the results of the one paper I have published in Ecological Economics and to help you illustrate the relationship and how we can use modeling tools to think about it. The motivation of this paper is because of the new, of the new trend of pollution in the United States. According to EPA, new trend is one of America, maybe the hardest or the most, most widespread, costly, and challenging environmental problem. There are a lot of environmental effects of those nutrients coming to the different water bodies, like the algal blooms, we have, we have seen the picture. And it will, it will also create dead zones, which means fish cannot survive there. There's, and we all love fishery. And also there are a lot of people relying on fishery for their life. So those people were impacted. If we think about the economic effects of those nutrient pollution, it will affect commercial fishing, which plays an important role for Florida's economy. But don't forget, in a lot of places, freshwater lakes are served as the sources of drinking water. You have nutrient there, you need to think about how to treat it. Otherwise, the nitrate will cause a blue baby syndrome. That's the things we don't want to see. We don't want to see that happen in our baby. And it will actually will affect real estate market. I'll tell you why in a minute. It will affect recreation. In Florida, recreation is the first or the largest economic impacts we, or economic source we have as the, as the economic generators. So it's, it will impact the Florida economy but there's many more. Well, now you may ask me, if there's an issue, what kind of policy do we have? Can we think about some ways to deal with it? Actually, this is a hard question. If, if you're familiar with the water issues in the United States, the, the law we have, or the, uh, the biggest umbrella we have for, reg for regulation, is Clean Water Act. And the last year is the 50 years of Clean Water Act. So in the Clean Water Act, they make it unlawful to, for those point solutions, for point source pollutions. You need some permit to, to pollute the point source. What I mean by the point source is the pollution that come from those factories, those industries. So you can put a monitor in there and it's easy to monitor them. But 
the pollution I'm going to talk about is agricultural pollution, what we call this non-point source. Non-point source is actually very hard to monitor and to regulate it because it changes across time and it's hard to put a monitoring devices in the form. So, and also for the Clean Water Act, they don't have specific rules for those non-point source pollution. They rely on the state government for, for regulation. So in Florida, for some water bodies, we have the regulation like TMDL, total maximum daily load. So basically they regulate the nutrient loadings you can have for different water bodies. But to see the effectiveness of those water policies, people want to know what's the economic impact, how it will affect me or my community if we have different dose regulations. And I believe modeling tool is the tool we need to build the policy target, which is the nutrient loadings to the, to the policy outcomes, which is what's the economic impact. So here, this is my modeling framework, maybe it's a little bit dry. See, we have different water policies here. So in Florida, in a lot of states, it's the total maximum daily loads. They will affect the nutrient loading changes to the lakes in, in terms of nitrogen and phosphorus. And in our team, we have a team of limnologists. They are very good at modeling lakes. So they use a general lake model to examine what's the relationship between the nutrient loadings to the lakes and the water qualities of lake, like the water clarity or the growth of algal blooms. The reason we want to do these translations is because for humans, it's hard for us to observe the nutrient loading change, but we can see the water clarity change. So I've interviewed a lot of people when I was doing the study, and I say, I say, Yes, I can definitely aware. I can see the algal bloom goes there, it goes and appears, and I can see which day the water is clean, <coughs> which day it's not. <coughs> Sorry. And then, after getting the water quality change, I'm using a hedonic price model, which I will tell you later. But generally, this model is see how we can transfer those water quality changes and then link it to the housing market, the real transaction of housing market. And as, as you will see, when you buy those lake front properties, those lake water quality actually will affect the, the lake the lake front property prices. The reason is people, the re, people buy lake front property is because they want to enjoy the amenities. But if the lake is dirty, no, I don't like it. I don't want to pay for it. My willingness to pay is low. And so the oh, okay, the water quality changes then will affect the housing prices. And don't forget that we collect property tax revenues from from the property market. So there, if there's a change in the property prices, the, the the property tax revenue we get for the local government will change as well. And then those those local government they use those lo the property taxes to support some local policies so the policies may change as well so this is how the feedback loops works in my case and i did this study in lake mendota watershed the reason is because i have a team of collaborators there and uh, if you if you have some experience with wisconsin this is a lake which draws a lot of attention to the people there and it's similar to the lake okeechobee we have we, they all have nutrient issues. Yeah, it's in Wisconsin. Like it's just outside the campus of UW Madison. So I work with you, the folks of UW Madison. There, they have the data for me to use. So this is a eutrophic lake, and it basically, if you go there, you can see the algal blooms every summer, like a lot of lakes we have in Florida, like Lake Okeechobee, and uh, the algal blooms will result in a lot of like unpleasant things, especially for beach closures and the degradation of ecosystem services. And uh, here is the lake water quality model I talked about. I'm not a limnologist, so I basically just give you some basic idea. 
I learned from them, studying a lake is not easy. Actually, there are more than 300 variables or dimensions we need to think about, about what will impact lake water quality. And, uh, but what we do is we explicitly model all those leaves. And then we say we just change the inflow, the nitrant, inf inf the, the nutrient inflow to the lake. And as we, what we see was the impact on lake water quality. And uh, basically, we simulate eight scenarios in this paper. We want to consider both nutrient loading increases and the nutrient loading decreases and how it affects the economic outcomes. And so we have a lot of data to model the lake, but we, we, can, we care about two output data. The first is the, you can think about water clarity, which is measured by stacky depths. So basically you can see there's a stacky depth and you put it in the water and the the time it appears, they will give you a sense about water clarity. And this is the way to mimic humans' eyes. So, so let's, that we can use some data which humans can observe. And then we have this, the chlorophyll A concentrations, basically helps us to think about the growth of algal blooms. And uh, here is my favorite property value model. So think about, this is a lake that maybe the lake, the, your favorite lakes. And then, then this is the lake front property. If, if the lake water quality is clean, is blue, is good, and uh, it's the same housing properties, it will, the, the, the market price of this property is high. But if we can think about suddenly, there's a change in water clarity. The water becomes, oh, the water becomes green and dirty. People don't want it. People don't want to buy it. So the market price of the, of the same property will become low. So the reason I can evaluate the economic values of water quality change or the water clarity change is based on the, differ it's based on the differences of the housing sales prices. And then here is the location of property sales I have. And it's all around Lake Mendota, but also I take control of the impact of Lake Monona. But as you will see, there may be, there's a lot of variables which will affect our housing prices. So as an economist, I'm good at this. So I'm taking into control the factors which will impact housing prices. So I get all the property sales records for that area. And that way I control those social demography information. I control those housing demo a housing characteristics. I control school district. I control the convenience and everything which could potentially impact the housing market. And then also I control the distance to lakes and thinking about how lake water quality will affect the different properties differently. But what we care about, what I care about is what's the water quality price premium for different dimensions. So basically, our intuition is that if the water quality is high, the premium we get from them in, in the housing market, it will, it will be high. So here's the, my results. What I found is, say, this is for individual properties in the Lake Mendota area, for the lakefront property. If we decrease nutrient, if we, if we decrease nutrient, say if we decrease 25% nutrient relative to status quo, on average, each property, their prices will increase 1.2%. So this is the real money gain from, from our study. And then we find similar things for other variables. But if you think about the aggregate value we get from that region, the aggregate value is we only take into account those lakefront properties. What you will see here is if you have 25% decrease in nutrient, and then you may get a $6 million from the decrease in nutrient. And this is just thinking about the property market. And then if you think about the tax revenue in different cities, 
this will be a good source for them to take care of some local issue. But my message is that this is just a small part of the economic benefits we can get from the protecting water resources just for those lakefront communities. But if you think about other things, there's a paper in Nature Communications recently by some famous water economists. And what they find out is if we protect the water qualities, we should also think about the greenhouse gas. Because if you think about the cycling of the lakes, everything is connected. So protecting water actually can help us elevate the greenhouse gas emissions we have. So they think about machine. And then I have myself I have another paper thinking about nitrous oxide emissions. Those are two different greenhouse gas. But our message is the same. It's like they found out the benefits of, of reducing greenhouse gas is tenfold com compared to the, the benefits we can get from protecting lake water quality. And I found out for another greenhouse gas, the benefits is, tw is 20 fold. So we need to think big. Even though we are talking about protecting water issues here, back to my private message, we need to think about how things are connected. Water, they are connected to greenhouse gas but also sometimes they're connected to air pollution. So what we are protecting for water resources, the benefits, at some benefits it can be quantified, but for some other benefits which cannot be quantified, we should also keep that in mind. And uh, I have talked a lot about Wisconsin, so I want to go back to Florida. So this is just my first year in Florida. As I said, I'm still learning about the water resources and also the resources I could get to support my own research. But I'm really glad to find the, the Florida Lake Watch Program. If you heard about them, they are um, um, citizen science program. So there are a lot of citizen scientists to help us monitoring the lake, to help us to figure out which lake we need to pay attention to which water quality is degrading, and actually they are the community partners. And also by doing this, they can have the first-hand experiences about lake water quality changes. And then they will reach out to local communities to think about what we can do to protect our lakes. I talked to the director, Mark, of this program, and we have the same idea. Our idea is people ask us a lot of times when I was doing this research, so people tell us, people ask us, you do lake studies. Now you tell me, can I get the lake I had when I was young? Like it's like 50 years ago. I want that lake. I want that clean lake. Unfortunately, a lot of research outcomes were saying it's like, unfortunately, it's very hard. I, I don't want to say no, but it's very hard. So what we are doing right now is actually just trying to protect our lakes, make less impact to them rather than restoring back to the lakes we all enjoy when, when we were young. So it's better to take action now and uh, because the benefits to get will be bigger. If we wait for another 10 years, 20 years, with those threats I just talked about, it's getting harder and harder to protect our water resources. So that's it. Thank you so much. Feel free to let me know if, I, if you have any questions. Uh, by the way, I'm happy to answer all the kind of questions. And look at the expression on that baby's face and its little fist. Yeah, we need to do you it. You want to take me on? <laughs> yeah, I always think about it. Sometimes I do this not just for myself, but for my baby and for the generation. Yes, yes. Thank you so much. Our questions, comments? Yes. Uh, how do you account for the domino effect 
that occurs if you take an industry, the housing industry or the cattle industry, and you cause them to make less profit in the short term. So how do you compensate them for changing the rules so they no longer have the same income? Consumer price increase. <laughs> Go ahead. I can I can answer it. I first I want to say this is a million dollar question, and a lot of policy makers are thinking about it. So thinking of, think like an economist, I totally understand it. Everyone wants to maximize their welfare. So for those industries, it's profit. I don't want to sacrifice my profit, but also I want to remind them there's something called social responsibility and also consumer preferences. It's like for example, now we are my colleagues, they are doing a lot of study. We are, see, we are seeing people are willing to pay high if it's organic, if it's environmental friendly. But also, I also want to raise the importance of ecosystem services. It's like, and uh, so for USDA, they have a lot of programs, it's like payment to ecosystem services to help transition to environmental friendly. <laughs> Thank you very much for an interesting talk. Um, and I guess the, I'm from the West, so the whole concept of Florida free water is uh, alien to my uh, sensibilities uh, as a Westerner uh, uh, or Texan, uh, where water is so scarce and so important. So I, I guess to me, I thought you were going to build a kind of model that would lead to some kind of public utility aspects of, I mean, if you compare them to electricity, which is also as important as water, perhaps, and therefore the pricing of public utilities, um, of which we have many uh, in the state, uh, should be should be a kind of a model for thinking about um, water. Um, and I, I guess, the, um, so the natural solution would um, be pricing uh, water and its um, uh, pollution aspects um, as a public utility. So uh, would there be uh, uh, necessary to create uh, like a public utility for water use and uh, have a prescribed uh, procedure to develop the cost of capital for any investments in the water resources. So I'm just kind of uh, saying uh, water is not unique from other types of products like electricity uh, that have a public interest and does have some degradation and some issues about, uh, as in the West, uh, the long transmission lines are causing um, fires um, along the power lines. So I'm kind of thinking that, that there needs to be more development along a public utility aspect uh, for the water, but that may raise a, a lot of political issues such as Rodman Reservoir and restriction to satisfy uh, a limited number of fishermen. Um, so I, I'm saying, do we need to create a public utility commission that focuses on water primarily and establish the regulatory structure there, uh, thereby? Well, thank you so much for the question. I really like the question about the public utilities because this is what I'm recently studying. I'm just started, so but I can give you some thoughts about it. So actually, the public water utility or the drinking water systems is actually different from the electricity systems. I'm seeing it's different because we need to keep in mind the water pollution, the water treatment issues. Now, I, I've been involved in our public, public water utilities conferences, and what we are, I'm hearing from all of them, it's like we need to think hard how to 
deal with the water pollution issues we have in the drinking water system. I'm not sure whether you are aware there's a new pollutant called PFAS. It's gained a lot of attention at EPA and also I think at, at other administrations, but EPA for sure. I work with EPA economists and the, just to fit in your a bit background, PFAS is a forever chemical. And now EPA just come up with a regulation law for the minimal PFAS we could have in the water systems. And then now those public utilities, they are talking about this because this is actually a challenge for them. If you think about the treatment cost. So another more details about water treatment is like, we need to think about, I, I just started through the research, I'm keep doing that. But I'm thinking from, I'm, I'm seeing from my data set is like, there are different water treatments or different water systems we have in the US. Even within Florida, we have those large water systems, but we, are, we also have those community systems. We have those tribes, they have, they have their own water system. We have the private well owners. They are all different. And, and also the water boundary, the water system boundary is, those, is also different from our administration boundaries. So this is actually a scientific question about how can we manage, how can we manage those water systems with the considerations of different capacity they have, different financial issues they have, and there are different technology, different ways to do the treatment. Because if you're thinking about the water treatment, we have hundreds of water pollutants which might appear in our drinking water systems. For some places, it could be PFAS. For some places, it could be nitrate. For some places, it could be lead. If you follow the news, there's we are doing a national study about lead pipeline. Where is that lead? Where is those lead service pipeline? And how it affects our 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 drinking water system, but also the community. Because if you follow the research, lead is really bad for child, especially for, for their brain development. So I think the hard question here is. We have different water pollutants for different places. We have different people managing those water systems. <coughs> and the how to coordinate those efforts is something I want to do as economists because that's like the message we need to think about, think about how things are connected. But what water is essential to life, electricity is not. Electricity is a modern convenience. Um, both of them have ex are impacted by external costs, the unmonetized external, what we call externalities. Um, anyway. Yeah, and it, uh, similar to what Pat Harden, a former board member of the St. John's River Water Management District asked, the gentleman says that if the grantor, for example, has to take, uh, I don't know, use less fertilizer and it grows lower crops and or has more less production from his cattle farm. But if he uses that fertilizer and I have uh, a kayaking outfit downstream or I'm getting my drinking water from downstream, I have to, it impacts me economically. Why should I pay the extra cost for him to make more profit? Uh, I, I don't know who your question is who pays. You give me a hard question, <laughs> but I, I can share some thoughts about it. Uh, okay, I will answer your question first and then I will come back to the chat. Uh, it's yeah, the same question, that's what she's asking. Okay, so. <sighs> This is actually a classical economic issue about property right. And I always tell my students, it, for water, actually, it's very complicated. If you think about people upstream, and if you think about people downstream, what you are doing upstream will affect the people downstream. Now the question is, who has the right to pollute? Who has the right to enjoy the amenity? Who owns this water? It's, it's, and actually, this related to the Western part is like they also have these issues. Who owns the water? Who has the right to use the water? So in I'll talk about the West first, because in the Western US, 
there's a lot of water rights question. It's like, uh, who gets who, who get the right to use this irrigation water? Some will say it's like prior appropriation doctrine. It's like you come here first, you get the water. But is this the efficient way to assign property right? No. It is it's a question it was exploring, but the, the outcome we are seeing is like the misallocation of water. But now that's a question beyond what I can do. As an economist, I can only tell you whether this is effective or not based on my model, but how to deal with it? Who has the right? That's not my area. I will leave it to policymakers. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the point sources no, are now limited. They have to treat their wastewater. The municipalities have, and industries have to treat their wastewater almost to drinking water quality. And in fact, in Florida, reclaimed water is treated. It's potable, basically. You, you probably don't want to drink it because, first of all, you've got this image of wastewater in your mind. But secondly, it smells more of chlorine than standard drinking water because it's highly chlorinated. Um, Non-point sources are much more difficult. And we have these total daily pollutant loads in the regulation. And supposedly that's implemented by best management practices. Well, nobody really evaluates whether these best management practices for farmers is effective, and nobody looks at what the farmers are doing in terms of implementing them. So as a consequence, we see a lot of surface water quality degradation, as well as aquifer impacts, as our earlier speakers detailed on the, on the, the we see in the springs. Um, where was I going? Oh, the impact on waterfront property values. In 1995-96, uh, my group did a study of the Indian River Lagoon, uh, economic, added economic benefit to the surrounding five counties. Uh, and just looking at what we call primary economic effects or benefits, it was $700 million a year of added benefit we found that waterfront property residential values were four times higher than residential property values a quarter of a mile away. Four times. Huge property tax uh, implications there for these five counties. We figured that would give them an incentive to be very careful about uh, nutrient runoff into the water body. 20 years later, another study is done by a different group. They are assessing $3 billion a year in economic impact, added value of the Indian Lagoon to these five counties. But that apparently did not provide any incentive for the local governments because now we have algal blooms in the Indian Lagoon when we have seagrass die off and resulting starving manatees that are being fed what, romaine lettuce or <laughs> spring mix? Or I can't imagine how expensive that is. I mean, when, when I go to the grocery store and I want to buy a head of romaine lettuce and it's $4, I'm thinking, the manatees are getting this? <laughs> so anyway, thank you so much for a very educational talk. I hope, did, do you have any more questions? No, any on the? Uh, no. Okay. So very good. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, by the way, may I distribute a survey like after this, like just see how the effectiveness of lecture because it's kind of my job is like see the effectiveness of the lecture. Okay. Can I just distribute it really quickly? Yes. It's just like 